but we can't fight it with the earthly weapons. Even the code, honor, courage, and commitment will only get us so far. Uh, that, that code can be part of our honor, but it will only get us so far. Look in your Bibles in 1 John chapter 5. And remember, midweek is a Bible study, and we definitely want to get <clears throat> into the Bible. And uh, I'm going to wait just a second here while everybody clicks there or turns there prayerfully. And so that we could talk about, you know, there's, there's the thing about living by a code. That's great. That's great moral stand. But again, moral stand will only get us so far. And it, it won't necessarily stop the invasion. Now, in 1 John chapter 5, verse 4, it says, this is the victory that has overcome the world. It talks about even our faith, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. <clears throat> and we're talk, when they're talking about believing in the Jesus of uh Believing in Jesus, it's the whole will of God. It's when we're living and breathing and thinking Jesus. And what's the goal there? It says, you know, who is it that overcomes the world? That's our goal. And the world for us is here where we live. And you may be asking, you know, there's so many of us uh, here who just found ourselves in Groton, and maybe you joined the Navy, and all of a sudden you were living on the west coast and here you are on the east coast and if we're living and breathing jesus he's like look the goal is to overcome the world and the weapon as uh that you know mark six kind of referred to as men of great faith not just men of good moral character though that's incredibly important but i know atheists that have good moral character so to speak and so all saved men have to have this, this thing of, I, I've got to walk in my belief. And yes, we need to be good, all right? Because the, otherwise, if we don't have good moral character, doors will close. And so we got to be kind. We got to be loving. We got to be patient. And we got to be self-controlled. But the fuel, the driving force of, of a man of God is that we walk as a true believer. And not just acknowledging that Jesus is the Son of God, but that each step is a, is a step of faith. Even going to work is a step of faith. Going to the store, because who knows in what ways God can use us, all right, to help overcome the world. Now, one of my favorite passages is as I look in First John chapter, I'm sorry, First Corinthians chapter three. One of my favorite passages, you know, I mean, I'm, it's not favorite in the sense that the Corinthian church was in trouble, but the Corinthian church was in big trouble here because they became like the world. Uh, there were unresolved conflicts. They were getting drunk at communion. I mean, th that's that's pretty bad. When you're getting drunk at communion, uh, you know, there was a lot of favoritism and uh, Paul rebuked them. Now, we may think we as a church have some struggles. And of course we do. We're, we're human beings. But hey, amen. At least we're not getting drunk at communion and, and, you know, some of those other things that are listed. But look at what he says to the Corinthians. He says, you are still worldly for since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? And here's the verse. Are you not acting like mere men? Man, I love that. <clears throat> and what that tells us is that you, brothers, you are not mere men. You are sons of God that are walking this earth. And we must never be mere men. God changes. He transformed us. And God is calling the men of the church here to walk on a different plane. You know, I, I've shared, I think I've shared this before in uh, reference to Lord of the Rings. When Frodo puts on the ring, all of a sudden, he's in this different realm. It's a dark realm. Okay? But we also put on our ring. Okay? In, the Luke, in Luke 15, where it talks about the prodigal son, and he gets, comes, goes back home, it says his father says, put a ring on him because to identify him as the, the son 
of this uh, son of this king. And so God put a ring on our finger, okay? And we become part of a different plane. We're no longer walking on the earthly plane. And, and I love that about this, that, that we don't live as mere men. And look, look in Galatians chapter 2. And I don't want to walk this earth as a mere man. I, I don't want to live as those, those guys do. I, I want to be on a different path, something different. And I look and we see the outcomes of their lives. I don't want to have anything to do with that. I don't want to have anything to go back. I don't want to go back to my old life. I want to put the ring on. And be in a different plane and said, this one's a, a heavenly plane. This one's a holy plane. It's, it's the light of Christ. And in Galatians chapter 2, a verse we all know well, it says, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And so it says what? I'll be finishing here in a moment. It says, I no longer live. And so when we were baptized, that old self that lived on this earthly plane that was concerned with earthly things died. And it says, so now Christ lives in me. That's my reality. That's my reality. I'm not a mere man anymore. And you're not a mere man. Now I know plenty of times we feel like mere men. And God understands that, but that's why he gives us the Holy Spirit to help us to put that ring back on, so to speak. And then it says, you know, the life I now live, it says, I live by faith. Because we still have free will, and God says, hey, the life you now live, now you're going to live by faith. And <clears throat> now we could go back and be a nice moral person, but who wants to go back to living on the earthly plane? Now we got the ring on, you know, you know how we ought to feel? We ought to feel like, man, God has got this. You're facing a challenge. You're like, man, I, I want to be fruitful. God has got this. I got this problem at work. God, he's got this. And that's living by faith. The belief that God is going to work in the situation to affect things on this heavenly plane. Now, brothers, uh, as the men's ministry, I, I believe let's let's put the brakes on living like mere men, and and have this idea of resurrecting the men's ministry to live on that heavenly plane. Because you are a son of God, you do have the ring on as a true son of God, and let's start pushing back the invasion that's happening, right? And so as a Christian, we want to push back the world. And as a Christian, we want the miracles of souls being saved. And so we want to uh, uh, have phrases like, man, I live by faith and God has got this. And my prayers are going to be made as a man of faith. My conduct will be made as a man of faith. My evangelism, my self-controls. And, uh, and I, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fantastically adventurous life with its challenges. Okay, but I'll tell you, I would rather have kingdom challenges than world challenges. I, I don't want to have challenges of mere men. I'd rather have challenges as a son of God. And so at this time, we're going to have some brothers just share, share things from their life or uh, parts of of the, the history we uh, have had in our, our, our movement or, or this church. And I'm not all really sure what they're going to share, but it is about their faith. So let's give our full attention. And I believe Wilf is going to start us out. Yes, that's the agenda when we're going to stick to the agenda. <laughs> so guys, I, I just want to, uh, I want to encourage you um, with, um, with something that's happened to me. Many of you know about this, but um, it was a huge hug from God um, in the last two or three weeks. Um, I, I overheard a conversation uh, at work. Two guys were talking, they were talking about the Bible and they were talking about getting into the Bible and scriptures. And so I went over to them and I said, uh, you guys talking about the Bible? 
And they said, yeah. And one of them was like, man, I've been reading. I've been reading it like every day, uh, like, like two hours a day. And uh, I went, whoa, uh, that's pretty cool. And he, he just got sharing with me about how he was loving it and he couldn't get enough of it. And, uh, and that his, that there were two other guys in our, now these, are, these three guys are all in my department. Two other guys who um, he's been getting with and talking with and, and discussing spiritual things at lunch. And so one of the guys, to my chagrin and somewhat shame, is a guy who sits right over the, the, the cube wall from me. And uh, I, I, have, I have never spoken to him, you know, about spiritual things. And um, so anyway, we, um, so uh, the, the kind of the bottom line, we have now studied um, three times. We're set up again for, for this Saturday. All three of these guys have been studying. And the, the one guy, um, the, the guy that, that was is probably most fired up, he, I, I have, so I'm, I'm starting to have lunch with these guys now on a regular basis. And, and he and I had lunch today. The other guys couldn't make it for different reasons. And he goes, he goes, you know, this stuff, we, we've studied discipleship. And we studied uh, the word and we, and we did another one on belief versus obedience. And he says, you know, this stuff is, he, he says, I can't wait to share this with other people. And uh, I was just, I was like, and it's such a joy to sit down and talk with him because he, uh, he's clearly, clearly searching and, and just so excited about what God is doing and, and his, you know, opportunities to, to uh, get his life right. And, and uh, so, um, yeah, God, guys, I did nothing. God dropped them into my lap. But um, I think he, um, you know, it's just, it's, it's just incredibly exciting to, to be a part of it. And uh, we'll see where it goes. But God's doing the work. It's very, very clear. He, and and uh, so um, hopefully you'll be seeing these guys around in the, in the future. That's all I got. Amen. Byron, you're up. That was awesome, Will. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's cool to get together and share faith building stories. Um, they're very encouraging and uh, it was super encouraging. Um, when I was, when I was asked to share, I, I, um, I, I thought of some things that encouraged me. And I also thought of this scripture and, uh, it says in Psalm, uh, Psalm 100, uh, in verse five, the Bible says, um, For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. And, um, you know, I've had a chance just to see God work, uh, not just uh, in short time, but through over a long period of time, over generations. And um, I know that for all of us, you know, the small thing we do or the small way God can use us, it can make a huge impact. Um, I had this nifty the hat here, and some of you seen, have seen me wear it. it says uh, Budapest, Hungary on it, right? And uh, some people say, "Hey, you know, where'd you get that hat?" I said, oh, "I got it in Budapest, Hungary. I bought it, bought it there." <laughs> they said, um, "You know, what's a black guy from New Jersey do it in Budapest, Hungary, right?" Um, well, the, the the way that you know, God really worked uh, goes way back to when I became a disciple. I became a disciple in the uh, college ministry group. Um, uh, quite a long time ago, and um, I was met by a guy named Brett, who um, reached out to me. I became a Christian, and um, I was in a fraternity, and a guy I knew named Mark, I reached out to him, became a Christian. There's two full bottles in there. And um, 
he uh, and uh, Mark actually went off to help plant the church, or lead the church planting of all places, Budapest, Hungary. <laughs> and I was there on a, a hope project with my daughter. But um, we started talking, sharing about our lives, and said, "Hey, you know, we're telling about yourself." I said, "Yeah," and he says, "Well, I, I knew Mark, and um, I had a chance to be next to you know people of my generation who were there, um, but also to." their kids and even their kids and serving together with hope um, 30 years later. Now, um, you know, another branch of that, my, my daughter, you know, fortunately became a Christian and um, she, uh, the way Brett reached out to me and of course my daughter became a Christian in my family and my daughter met two people that became Christians. And um, we have a picture of ourselves. We had got together with Brett, myself, my daughter, Alexa and Elsa and uh, uh, and their friend just across all generations. So be encouraged, you know, that one guy that will is gonna you know, baptize or whatever, he, he could uh, make a similar impact and so can you. So I have. Amen. Uh, it's Thanks, Byron. my turn, I just gotta make myself spotlight there we go all right hey guys sorry about that it's tough to like organize all this all at the same time and try to talk but um so i wanted to share about a faith building story for me when i was at in campus in 2008 i was approached by and some of you've heard the story i don't know if everybody's heard the story i was approached by kevin miller doug arthur and valder koha and they asked me to move to yukon to plant a church. Now, keep in mind, we hadn't planted a church in about seven years uh, in New England. And, and they asked me to move down there to be on staff and go there. And, and I remember being kind of torn. Uh, I had an offer to go to a fairly prestigious grad program called Entrepreneurial Engineering, which is basically, instead of just designing something, instead of coming with concept, I would concept through design. And it was a two-year program. Um, and I also had an offer from a big engineering firm to do a construction management. Um, and I was praying and fasting for about a year, or not a year, for about a month, sorry. And Glenn Bertuzzi did this awesome lesson on faith. And I don't even remember the lesson necessarily. I just remember at the end of the lesson going, I have to do this. And it's funny because just the week before, I had, I had gotten lunch with Sean Wooten. And I asked Sean Wooten how, if those who know Sean Wooten, Sean Wooten's a minister over in Kiev and basically gave up a six-figure job in Wall Street to go over there and plant a church in one of the most volatile areas in our world. And and I asked him, like, how did you decide to do that? And he told me to take the best opportunity that comes your way. Meaning if there's a ministry position that isn't really that appealing, don't just jump in it to be in the ministry. And if there's a great job that's appealing that you think you could still serve God through, take that job. And he kind of just went through this whole, like, don't just do something because you feel like you have to do it. Take the opportunity that's going to bring about the greatest chance to bring glory to God. And that could be a secular job. And, and then, you know, the week later, Glenn did that faith. And so I decided to take the job at stores, having no clue what I was doing. And this is 23-year-old Danny, um, which is a pretty scary Danny. Or no, 22-year-old Danny, sorry. Pretty scary Danny. Um, and I'm moving to Connecticut. That's how I ended up in Connecticut in stores. And I remember June 12th, we moved there. We did a whole summer missions program. And then we started in September. We started with three campus disciples. Two of them you guys know very well. You know, uh, at the time, Adriana Hickling. And at the time, Becky Glennie and Michael Spangler. And that was my campus students. And then we had 17 total disciples. And it's crazy because the first two couples they asked to co-lead with me to help organize the marriage said no. One of them decided not to come at all. And the other one just said, we're not doing it. We'll be in the group, but we're not going to help lead. And so finally, the third couple they asked, the Lewises, you guys know the Lewises, said yes. And so you imagine the Mac, Danny MacDougall and the Lewises. That's a very interesting combo. Um, but we said, we're going to go for it. We, we just had faith. We said we we're going to be radical and do whatever we could. And for the first two weeks of every semester, we'd have a Bible talk every single day. <clears throat> every Once a week, we'd get together at like 645, 7 o'clock. We'd get campus students out of bed and go pray until our 8 a.m. classes. Um, we would just share our faith with hundreds, thousands of people just going crazy about it. We had a blast together. We just became a family. But we were just the whole time knowing that God was going to do something very special. We actually became a club on campus which was very hard to do because, you know, our church is kind of known in different areas. Um, and that first year we had three baptisms and we were pretty like excited, but, you know, wishing there was more. But after three years of being there, 
in sharing our faith with tons of people. We studied the Bible on average with 50 college students every semester, um, which God provided all of them. I mean, it was amazing. At least 50, right? And we, we baptized, by the time we got through that, we were baptizing about 16 people in the last year there, most of them campus students. And we went from three campus students to 20 campus students. We went from 17 total disciples to 40 disciples. We had a full operating kids kingdom. We had, we even had a band, right? Like we were, we were cranking out a band. We had a steel drum, saxophone, guitar band. Like you want to know weird, crazy bands, but it was just because we just had faithful people that wanted to do whatever they could to serve God. And I just felt so inspired by everybody because, because realistically it wasn't, I was sharing my vid a lot of people, but I wasn't meeting all these people. It was just, it was these campus students that were just fired up about bringing people to God. Um, but when we left, we were averaging with 40 disciples, somewhere between 80 and 90 people at church on Sunday, not including kids. And so we, we were having these awesome worship services on campus. We were getting known as a good club. We were having three different Bible talks every week that were operating and studying the Bible. And it was just pretty amazing just to see that we went from the small group of hodgepodge people that had no clue what they were doing and God just took our faith and made it something spectacular, something that I think was really amazing. And and a lot of these disciples have gone all over the place. Some of them are in Haiti right now. Some are on the West Coast. There's some in the Southern Church, you know, Priscilla Lombardi, she was one of the disciples there. Ashley Gill, there's a bunch of these people in De Dennis Hanton, you guys know him, he's up in Massachusetts, but these disciples that are all over the place here um, who are just serving God's kingdom still and being very faithful. So I think that's the story because it had nothing to do with me. It had everything to do with just God doing, doing crazy stuff through a stupid kid. So, amen. It's pretty amazing. And we're at John now. Amen. That was awesome, man. That was awesome, Danny. Um, wow. You know, just reflecting back, you know, there was a time. I remember I became a disciple in 1989, January. And um, it was actually Super Bowl Sunday. Don't ask me who was in it because I couldn't care less. But um, that's, that's the year I studied the Bible. And, um, you know, when I first came out, they were like, you know, at, they asked me to come to church, the disciples did. And they were like, when I showed up, they were like, uh, did we tell you the church was in Providence? And they hadn't done that, you know, they hadn't said that. And it's like, oh, okay, you know, and, but there was just two carloads of people, one carload of uh, marrieds, maybe two families, and um, a carload of singles. And uh, it was really, really small. Um, whatever the numbers are, it was really small. And uh, we did that for years, but it was such an amazing time to remember. And that, that year they had the last uh, Boston World Mission Seminar. Some of you might remember going to that in uh, August of 1989. And, uh, such an incredible time and just remembering praying in the they bring there were like um 14 000 people there it was small by comparison to some of the recent conferences we've had but it was gigantic because almost every disciple in the world was there and it was amazing because we were praying for com you know the communist um uh areas in europe the the Berlin Wall was still up. The Cold War was still hot. Uh, it was just a, a, an amazing time. And we were praying for all these things to happen, for places to, to open up in uh, Eastern Europe and for the Berlin Wall to come down. And guess what happened that year? The Berlin Wall came down. And it was just an amazing, amazing time. And one of the things that we would do is uh, we would like two or three of us would go for a discipling time at 11 o'clock at night. I don't know why we did it then, but it was 11 o'clock at night on a Friday to IHOP. And it doesn't exist anymore, but there was one here in Groton and we would sit and talk and uh, have breakfast or whatever. And, and just dream about having a church here in Groton. And, you know, that just seemed like a pipe dream, you know, but we wanted to dream big. We felt like, you know, God can do that. It can use us. And uh, it, it was such, it was fun while we were enjoying our breakfast, just to think about, you know, having 200 people, what would that feel like? What would it feel like? It was so amazing because we were talking about such a small number uh, of disciples at the time. And 
a few short years later in 1995, the church here in Groton had grown to 70 disciples. We, we were funding about a third of the Providence Church. And they realized that they couldn't continue. That was a very unhealthy dynamic. And it, what was healthy was for us to become our own church. And um, so we were planted in July of 1995. And uh, it, it was just such an amazing time to be thinking about invitations and you know, inviting lots of people and where are we gonna meet? And we had ownership of everything. You know, we had to come up with a kid's kingdom. We had to have, you know, for everything from tags to people to lead it to, I mean, it was just everything. We weren't just part of something that someone else was doing. We were, we had our own and it was such a fun time, a scary time, but we could live on the edge and it was, it was neat. And for several years, we would continue to travel to, um, to Providence periodically and, um, you know, very shortly afterwards, it became obvious that we needed to, you know, to, to meet here permanently. But uh, that was 26 years ago. You know, we had our 25th anniversary last year as a separate ministry, as a separate church. And uh, it just God has done amazing things here and will continue to do that. He used, what, eight guys, you know, eight guys and girls uh essentially only one child in the church at the time and has ballooned it amazingly and think about what god can do if we get out of the way you know and let him use our mustard seed of faith to do amazing things and that's what i have to share And now for the rest of the story from that time frame, um, I came to Disciple in 93, and um, a year later, I started leading a Bible talk. So I was a young Bible talk leader, had no idea what I'm doing, but we had a meeting up in Providence, and four of the single Bible talk leaders at the time were writing back. And we just talked about dreams and what we wanted to accomplish for God down here in Grand New London. And we looked at each other and was like, let's have an all night prayer. And there's a lot of brothers here that are part of this, that were part of that. So it was summer 94, we had this all night prayer over at uh, Westerly at Watch Hill. And God moved tremendously. We had more brothers here go on staff in the next three years. That growth of the church was mostly singles at that time and mostly Navy men because we were out sharing our faith. We were out talking to people. I think on average, the groups had two or three Bible studies going on, and it wasn't the leaders studying with it. It was everybody doing their part, and I think that's what the faith was. The whole church said, we're going to do something great, and the single brothers just decided to take the lead. And of course, we all got married and we're still leading here, but it was an incredible time of faith where ownership was saying God's going to work through us. And it, it, it was amazing because when 95 came around and we had our planning and started, it started off full bang, bang and it just continued growing and growing ever since then. So that's all I have to share on that. Not to mention your fiance came to town that day. She um, commissioned in that month. That was 95, but. Yeah, July 95. There was more to the story in 94, but that's uh, another hero there. It's a story that inspired people on getting married or dating. So hold on, there we go. So what we're gonna do now in a few minutes is we're gonna go into some breakout rooms, uh, before we go in the breakout rooms and direction, just want to do a couple extra announcements. Uh, first of all, remember, worship starts at 10 a.m. this Sunday streaming. So be ready to pop then instead of 1015. Uh, Kids Kingdom program and preteen kid program all moved to like 949. Or preteen was already earlier, but the Kids Kingdom program is going to be at 940 if that affects you at all. So you all know. Um, tomorrow night is the first Thursday of the month, which is our Zoom Bible talk that we're trying to outreach. So if you got someone studying the Bible, that's something to invite them to. The link's on the website. 
invite people to it. We're gonna have a good time. Uh, Mike's doing the Bible talk this week, I believe, and, and and bring people to that. It'll be great. We do it every first and third Thursday for Zoom studies. And and guys, just as we kind of break out, uh, if you notice a trend in a lot of these stories, they're all revolving around people found other people to study the Bible with, and their faith was blown up in a great way. And we and we found other people to reach out to. We found other purpose to serve God. I mean, that really faith is going to come from doing something radical, doing something faithful, doing something inspiring and letting God come in and take it and make it even bigger than you could imagine. And so as we break onto these breakout rooms, we should really just share, just share with each other how we can live by faith so these faithful stories can happen to us. And also, if you got your own faithful story to share, share it because that's inspiring. And that's what really gets us excited about doing these things. We got Wilf's story who happened like a couple weeks ago. We got John's story who happened in 1989. And you know, my story in the mid 2000s, like, because this story is littered throughout all of our lives that we can share. And so we'll break on to breakout rooms, um, share how you can live by faith so God can do some awesome stuff with you or share a faithful story of yourself. Let's have a great time encouraging one another. I'm going to start them up in a second here. Breakout rooms. Let me get them ready. And Go have some fun. Opened now.